Chapter sixty eight of the Old Curiosity Shop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixty eight. Lighted rooms, bright fires, cheerful faces, the music of glad voices, words of love and welcome, warm hearts, and tears of happiness. What a change is this! But it is to such delights that Kit is hastening. They are awaiting him, he knows. He fears he will die of joy before he gets among them. They have prepared him for this all day. He is not to be carried off to-morrow with the rest, they tell him first. By degrees they let him know that doubts have arisen, that inquiries are to be made, and perhaps he may be pardoned after all. At last, the evening being come, they bring him to a room where some gentlemen are assembled. Foremost among them is his good old master, who comes and takes him by the hand. He hears that his innocence is established, and that he is pardoned. He cannot see the speaker, but he turns towards the voice, and in trying to answer, falls down insensible. They recover him again, and tell him he must be composed, and bear this like a man. Somebody says he must think of his poor mother. It is because he does think of her so much, that the happy news had overpowered him. They crowd about him, and tell him that the truth has gone abroad, and that all the town and country ring with sympathy for his misfortunes. He has no ears for this. His thoughts, as yet, have no wider range than home. Does she know it? What did she say? Who told her? He can speak of nothing else. They make him drink a little wine, and talk kindly to him for a while, until he is more collected, and can listen and thank them. He is free to go. Mr. Garland thinks, if he feels better, it is time they went away. The gentlemen cluster round him and shake hands with him. He feels very grateful to them for the interest they have in him, and for the kind promises they make. But the power of speech is gone again, and he has much ado to keep his feet even though leaning on his master's arm. As they come through the dismal passages, some officers of the jail who are in waiting there congratulate him, in their rough way, on his release. The newsmonger is of the number, but his manner is not quite hearty. There is something of surliness in his compliments. He looks upon Kit as an intruder, as one who has obtained admission to that place on false pretences, who has enjoyed a privilege without being duly qualified. He may be a very good sort of young man, he thinks, but he has no business there, and the sooner he is gone, the better. The last door shuts behind them. They have passed the outer wall, and stand in the open air, in the street he has so often pictured to himself when hemmed in by the gloomy stones, and which has been in all his dreams. It seems wider and more busy than it used to be. The night is bad, and yet how cheerful and gay in his eyes! One of the gentlemen, in taking leave of him, pressed some money into his hand. He has not counted it, but when they have gone a few paces beyond the box for poor prisoners, he hastily returns and drops it in. Mr. Garland has a coach waiting in a neighbouring street, and, taking Kit inside with him, bids the man drive home. At first they can only travel at a foot-pace, and then with torches going on before, because of the heavy fog. But, as they get farther from the river, and leave the closer portions of the town behind, they are able to dispense with this precaution, and to proceed at a brisker rate. On the road, hard galloping would be too slow for Kit, but, when they are drawing near the journey's end, he begs they may go more slowly, and, when the house appears in sight, that they may stop, only for a minute or two, to give him time to breathe. But there is no stopping then the old gentleman speaks stoutly to him, the horses mend their pace, and they are already at the garden gate. Next minute they are at the door. There is a noise of tongues and tread of feet inside. It opens. Kit rushes in, and finds his mother clinging round his neck. And there, too, is the ever-faithful Barbara's mother, still holding the baby, as if she had never put it down since that sad day when they little hoped to have such joy as this. There she is, heaven bless her, 
crying her eyes out, and sobbing as never woman sobbed before. And there is little Barbara, poor little Barbara, so much thinner and so much paler, and yet so very pretty, trembling like a leaf and supporting herself against the wall. And there is Mrs. Garland, neater and nicer than ever, fainting away stone dead, with nobody to help her. And there is Mr. Abel, violently blowing his nose, and wanting to embrace everybody. And there is the single gentleman hovering round them all, and constant to nothing for an instant. And there is that good, dear, thoughtful little Jacob, sitting all alone by himself on the bottom stair, with his hands on his knees, like an old man, roaring fearfully, without giving any trouble to anybody, and each and all of them are, for the time, clean out of their wits, and do jointly and severally commit all manner of follies. And even when the rest have in some measure come to themselves again, and can find words and smiles, Barbara, that soft-hearted, gentle, foolish little Barbara, is suddenly missed, and found to be in a swoon by herself in the back parlour, from which swoon she falls into hysterics, and from which hysterics into a swoon again, and is, indeed, so bad, that despite a mortal quantity of vinegar and cold water, she is hardly a bit better at last than she was at first. Then Kit's mother comes in, and says, Will he come and speak to her? And Kit says, Yes, and goes. And he says in a kind voice, Barbara, and Barbara's mother tells her that it's only Kit, and Barbara says with her eyes closed all the time, Oh, but is it him indeed? And Barbara's mother says, To be sure it is, my dear, there's nothing the matter now. And in further assurance that he's safe and sound, Kit speaks to her again. And then Barbara goes off into another fit of laughter, and then into another fit of crying. And then Barbara's mother and Kit's mother nod to each other and pretend to scold her, but only to bring her to herself the faster. Bless you. And being experienced matrons, and acute at perceiving the first dawning symptoms of recovery, they comfort Kit with the assurance that she'll do now, and so dismiss him to the place from whence he came. Well, in that place, which is the next room, there are decanters of wine, and all that sort of thing, set out as grand as if Kit and his friends were first-rate company, and there is little Jacob, walking, as the popular phrase is, into a homemade plum-cake, at a most surprising pace, and keeping his eye on the figs and oranges which are to follow, and making the best use of his time, you may believe. Kit no sooner comes in, than that single gentleman, never was such a busy gentleman, charges all the glasses, bumpers, and drinks his health, and tells them he shall never want a friend while he lives. And so does Mr. Garland, and so does Mrs. Garland, and so does Mr. Abel. But even this honour and distinction is not all, for the single gentleman forthwith pulls out of his pocket a massive silver watch, going hard and right to half a second, and upon the back of this watch is engraved Kit's name, with flourishes all over. And in short, it is Kit's watch, bought expressly for him, and presented to him on the spot. You may rest assured that Mr. and Mrs. Garland can't help hinting about their present, in store, and that Mr. Abel tells outright that he has his, and that Kit is the happiest of the happy. There is one friend he has not seen yet, and as he cannot be conveniently introduced into the family circle, by reason of his being an iron-shod quadruped, Kit takes the first opportunity of slipping away and hurrying to the stable. The moment he lays his hand upon the latch, the pony neighs, the loudest pony's greeting. Before he has crossed the threshold, the pony is capering about his loose-box, for he brooks not the indignity of a halter, mad to give him welcome. And when Kit goes up to caress and pat him, the pony rubs his nose against his coat, and fondles him more lovingly than ever pony fondled man. It is the crowning circumstance of his earnest, heartfelt reception and Kit fairly puts his arm round Whisker's neck, and hugs him. But how comes Barbara to trip in there? And how smart she is again! She has been at her glass since she recovered. How comes Barbara in the stable, of all places in the world? Why, since Kit has been away, the pony would take his food from nobody but her, 
and Barbara, you see, not dreaming that Christopher was there, and just looking in to see that everything was right, has come upon him unawares. Blushing little Barbara. It may be that Kit has caressed the pony enough. It may be that there are even better things to caress than ponies. He leaves him for Barbara, at any rate, and hopes she is better. Yes, Barbara is a great deal better. She is afraid, and here Barbara looks down and blushes more, that he must have thought her very foolish. Not at all, says Kit. Barbara is glad of that, and coughs. <clears throat> Just the slightest cough possible. Not more than that. What a discreet pony when he chooses! He is as quiet now as if he were of marble. He has a very knowing look, but that he always has. "'We have hardly had time to shake hands, Barbara,' says Kit. Barbara gives him hers. Why, she is trembling now. Foolish, fluttering Barbara. Arm's length? The length of an arm is not much. Barbara's was not a long arm, by any means. And besides, she didn't hold it out straight, but bent a little. Kit was so near her when they shook hands, that he could see a small tiny tear yet trembling on an eyelash. It was natural that he should look at it, unknown to Barbara. It was natural that Barbara should raise her eyes unconsciously and find him out. Was it natural that at that instant, without any previous impulse or design, Kit should kiss Barbara? He did it, whether or no. Barbara said, for shame, but let him do it, too. Twice. He might have done it thrice, but the pony kicked up his heels and shook his head, as if he were suddenly taken with convulsions of delight, and Barbara, being frightened, ran away. Not straight to where her mother and Kit's mother were, though, lest they should see how red her cheeks were, and should ask her why. Sly little Barbara! When the first transports of the whole party had subsided, and Kit and his mother, and Barbara and her mother, with little Jacob and the baby to boot, had had their suppers together, which there was no hurrying over, for they were going to stop there all night, Mr. Garland called Kit to him, and taking him into a room where they could be alone, told him that he had something yet to say which would surprise him greatly. Kit looked so anxious, and turned so pale on hearing this, that the old gentleman hastened to add he would be agreeably surprised, and asked him if he would be ready next morning for a journey. "'For a journey, sir?' cried Kit. "'In company with me, and my friend in the next room. Can you guess its purpose?' Kit turned paler yet, and shook his head. "'Oh, yes, I think you do already,' said his master. "'Try!' Kit murmured something rather rambling and unintelligible, but he plainly pronounced the words. "'Miss Nell!' Three or four times, shaking his head while he did so, as if he would add that there was no hope of that. But Mr. Garland, instead of saying, try again, as Kit had made sure he would, told him very seriously that he had guessed right. "'The place of their retreat is indeed discovered,' he said. "'At last, and that is our journey's end.' Kit faltered out such questions as, where was it? and how had it been found, and how long since, and was she well and happy? "'Happy she is, beyond all doubt,' said Mr. Garland. "'And, well, I—I I trust she will be soon. She has been weak and ailing, as I learn, but she was better when I heard this morning, and they were full of hope. Sit you down, and you shall hear the rest.' Scarcely venturing to draw his breath, Kit did as he was told. Mr. Garland then related to him how he had a brother, of whom he would remember to have heard him speak, and whose picture, taken when he was a young man, hung in the best room. And how his brother lived a long way off, in a country place, with an old clergyman who had been his early friend. How, although they loved each other as brothers should, they had not met for many years, 
but had communicated by letter from time to time, always looking forward to some period when they would take each other by the hand once more, and still letting the present time steal on, as it was the habit for men to do, and suffering the future to melt into the past. How this brother, whose temper was very mild and quiet and retiring, such as Mr. Abel's, was greatly beloved by the simple people among whom he dwelt, who quite revered the bachelor, for so they called him, and had every one experienced his charity and benevolence. How even those slight circumstances had come to his knowledge, very slowly and in course of years, for the bachelor was one of those whose goodness shuns the light, and who have more pleasure in discovering and extolling the good deeds of others than in trumpeting their own, be they never so commendable. How, for that reason, he seldom told them of his village friends, but how, for all that, his mind had become so full of two among them, a child and an old man, to whom he had been very kind, that, in a letter received a few days before, he had dwelt upon them from first to last, and had told such a tale of their wandering and mutual love, that few could read it without being moved to tears. How he, the recipient of that letter, was directly led to the belief that these must be the very wanderers for whom so much search had been made, and whom heaven had directed to his brother's care. How he had written, for such further information as would put the fact beyond all doubt, how it had that morning arrived, had confirmed his first impression into a certainty, and was the immediate cause of that journey being planned which they were to take to-morrow. "'In the meantime,' said the old gentleman, rising, and laying his hand on Kit's shoulder, "'you have a great need of rest, for such a day as this would wear out the strongest man. Good night!' and heaven send our journey may have a prosperous ending. End of chapter 68